Well, certainly the pandemic has uh, put a lot of challenges forth for many people across the United States. It has been also a time where many uh, elements of society have had to pivot. The Wharton School, uh, much like every other business, has had to pivot over the course of time uh, in terms of uh, having students ready for school, whether it be in a virtual setting or wherever. Uh, pleasure to be joined right now by the new dean of the Wharton School, Erica James, who joins us on uh, the Zoom call right now. Dean James, I, I say new, you've been here for nine months, but to a degree there is an element of this being new because of what you've been dealing with with the pandemic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in fact, I think I'll have two first years. I'll have the first year, which is experiencing Wharton virtually through the pandemic. And then next year, I hopefully will be experiencing Wharton in person, which will give me a very different perspective. So it's a, it's a very long onboarding in that regard. Yeah, so what's, what has been the, the process been like for you over these first nine months? Well, it's been an evolution. So I started uh, in the summer, which was at that point where very shortly into my uh, arrival, we needed to make decisions on how we were going to execute an educational experience for all of our students. And so, so much of my time early on was sort of being really in the weeds on very specific decisions that we would need to make. Ordinarily, that's a time period where a new leader would come in and start their listening tour and meet people and, and whatnot. And there really just wasn't that, op that option. So I was meeting people in the context of this crisis. Over the months, you know, we've, we got settled, we executed our, our semester, and then I could sort of elevate my focus to think about how to engage more broadly across the school, think more long-term, put some strategic thinking uh, into the work and not just the here and now decision-making that was taking place. So I know part of your career has been dealing with crisis leadership and researching that. And, and certainly when you think about the last uh, 13 months at this point, uh, obviously leadership has been a big key and obviously dealing with crisis has, uh, has been uh, an important element. How has this last 13 months adapted or changed or tweaked your thinking about that concept? Yeah, well, I don't know that it's changed it so much as it's reinforced it. So when I wrote academically about leadership and crisis leadership in particular, the real focus was on recognizing the human element in the midst of a crisis. And I think that that has been reinforced living through this pandemic, living through also some other forms of crises. We've had you know, students and faculty and staff living across the world who've, who have battled natural disasters in the midst of all of this, who have battled the racial unrest that we've had in the midst of all of this. So there were a number of factors that were focusing our attention. And I think that for me, the important lessons in all of that is the, the humanity and we're all trying mm -hmm. to make the best under the circumstances that we have. And I would also add that communication just continues to be such an important part of leadership, both communicating what you're doing, but also why you're doing it, why you're making the decisions so that people understand the context that they're operating in. So obviously the other part to this is the connection you have with the students there at Warden. And again, obviously a very unique uh, setting to start out this process with. How do you think they have handled all of this? Well, if there's one thing that I have learned about the Wharton student community, and that's whether you're undergraduate or MBA students or our executive students, is that there's a, a level of resilience here that has really been remarkable and inspiring. Um, that said, it's also very clear that, that students are struggling through this. There's a, a level of isolation when you are operating from constrained physical spaces when you can't physically be together with peers, with colleagues. And so we recognize that that's part of the reality for our students. And it's inspiring to see the ways in which the Wharton community, the student community in particular, is coming together to support one another through all of this. So it's a, I would say, you know, it's a resilient lot. I, I had seen a LinkedIn piece that you had done about three months into your time at Wharton. And in that piece, you talked about the concept of, of trust and more specifically swift trust, which it, what's the definition of that for you? So swift trust is actually a, a concept developed by a, a, a colleague at another institution. And it really is meant to indicate that when we think of developing trusting relationships, we think of it over a period of time and you build evidence 
to suggest whether someone is trustworthy or not. But there are numerous circumstances where we don't have the, the, the benefit of time to make that assessment. And we have to engage in what we call swift trust, which is sort of instantaneous trust. And there, I'll give you a couple examples. When you're, God forbid, if your house ever burns down and it's on fire and you call the fire department, you're not going to interview the fire department. You're not going to ask for their track record. You're not going to go through things that you would ordinarily do to give you a sense of confidence in their capability. You're going to call the fire department and expect them to be there and do their job. So you're inherently trusting them with virtually no evidence, no data to support your, your rationale for trusting them. And I think that when I arrived here uh, as a new dean in the midst of this crisis where I couldn't meet people in person. I didn't have the, um, the available data to suggest you know, whether people were trustworthy, nor did they have that information about me. And yet we had to do real work together. And so that was a form of swift trust. You assume positive intent and assume the best in people. So uh, one of the other things you talked about in that piece is about finding energizers, which what, what is, what's an energizer to you? Energizers are people who uh, create enthusiasm, they create energy, they inspire you, they give you, they help to give you the, the wherewithal to, to continue to work through what are really difficult circumstances. Um, rather than people who are going to weigh you down, who are going to bring you down, who are the naysayers and make your job more challenging. I always find it helpful to surround myself with people who make the work that we're doing together possible and enjoyable. Uh, one of the terms we've used a lot uh, during the time of doing these shows remotely has been the term pivot. And so many businesses really have had to pivot uh, out of need of survival in, in many cases. So from that perspective, with all of these pivots going on, how do you think firms and, and leadership uh, uh, leadership uh, uh, leaders are going to be able to truly understand and learn from this last 13 months of pivoting during this pandemic? Well, it, it, that's such an important question. And, and the work that I've done on crisis leadership, I, I intentionally refer to that as leadership as opposed to crisis management or crisis communications, because the learning element is such an important aspect. And I think when we're focused on managing a crisis, we're focused on the here and now and how to respond in the moment. And we lose sight of the responsibility, I think, that leaders have to actually reflect on what they have experienced once the crisis has been resolved. And it's in that reflection that the learning takes place. When you ask yourselves, how did we get in, into this situation? What, and how did, what ways did we contribute to this? What ways were we ready? What ways were we not ready? And then once you go through that exercise of reflection, then you begin to identify lessons that you can incorporate for how you will operate your organization or your business going forward. What do you think then Wharton's responsibility or to a degree, any business school, top business school, what's their responsibility to society at this point? to help businesses, communities, or is it something more than that? I think we, we have a tremendous responsibility. Uh, we are the conduit that is helping to prepare the next generation of leaders. And the more we can help them both learn how to navigate through challenging circumstances, how to, how to uh, pivot, as you suggested earlier, or engage in, in effective change practices, that's a part of leadership. And those are the kinds of skills uh, that we will need for our leaders going forward. So I think we do have that incredible responsibility, but I would also say that business schools in particular have, uh, because of the tremendously important research that our faculty engage in, and many of our schools are engaging in research that is are addressing issues germane to today's context that can help business leaders and government leaders uh, make better decisions and make more informed decisions. So the more we're able to, to align the research of our faculty with the needs of society, I think that's another contribution that we have a responsibility to play as well. So your appointment, if my math is correct, was announced just about a year ago, maybe a little bit over a year ago. And so obviously a lot has changed in our world in that time. Has anything changed about your outlook or your goals as the Dean of the Wharton School? Uh, 
<laughs> well, so I was announced as dean in February of 2020. I started in July 2020. And in those intervening months, I was still dean at another institution. And so I was very focused on sort of navigating that school through the crisis, which didn't give me the same kind of uh, ability to think exclusively on the new institution, which would be Wharton. So I didn't really have specific goals coming into Wharton. I had assumed that I would have the opportunity to sort of learn about the environment and then make some assessments about what the future could hold. Uh, so, so my goals haven't changed, but they have been informed by the experience that we've been living in, in um, as a result of the pandemic and so many other social issues this year. Uh, and one of those things is really uh, how do we leverage business and business education and the students that will be coming out as the next generation of leaders? How do we leverage the, the work that we do in business schools to really align with and add value to some of the societal issues that has, is capturing everyone's attention? How do we help in policy decisions? How do we help in uh, climate-related decisions? The research of our faculty can address so many of those things. And I think it's, it's high time for all business schools to really leverage the applicability of the work that we do to address some of the, the challenges that we see in society while also serving the academy itself. Well, Dean, it's been a pleasure having you uh, joining us for a few moments and uh, look forward to seeing you on campus at some point later this year. Likewise, thank you so much, Dan.